Um, hello, everyone. Officially, welcome to welcome to Tuesday. Welcome to Anthropology. Um, let's jump into where we left off because we had just finished watching. Um, actually, I'm going to go here. Oh, hang on. We had just okay. False start. Embarrassing. So we just finished watching um, The Perfect Runner, that documentary on Friday. What did you guys think of it? Was it interesting? Was it cool? Was it not cool? It was cool. Yeah, did it did it make you did it make you think about yourselves differently or a little bit? Now I'm thinking myself as a monkey or spending something. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, maybe not what I was aiming for, but okay, that's, that's good. As long as you're thinking differently, I guess that's I guess that's progress. Um, so we watched that documentary as part of the idea that we had come to the end of this story of human evolution, right? And I said, of course, we are the last species that we've talked about. We're the last bipedal primate species around. All of our other earlier ancestors have, of course, gone extinct, right? And so we said that we were built in a particular way. We're kind of a lightweight, um, gracile sort of hominid. We use lots of complex tools. I showed you a picture of a, a human skull here. And um, I said that um, there's a few adaptations that we kind of need to talk about about humans that we hadn't talked about yet. And so on Friday, I introduced you to this idea of the cognitive revolution, right? The idea that about 70,000 years ago, we start to see all kinds of new tools and artwork, like this little lion man statue, cave paintings in um, Spain and in uh, France mostly, very sort of delicate, very complex tools like these little blade tools, fish hooks, uh, and more complicated tools that are composite, right? So they have, they're made of different materials, sometimes stone and bone, sometimes stone and wood. Uh, and all of these are kind of associated with us, with Homo sapiens. And the idea here is that probably around this time or maybe just a little bit earlier, our species picked up a few genetic mutations, just like we saw in Your Inner Fish, where a few genetic mutations gave us the ability to see different wavelengths of light, right? To see the color red. A few extra gene mutations also changed the way our brain was wired, right? And so now we have a brain that is quite large. It has lots of lots of neurons in it, but those neurons are also interconnected in a way that's very different from most other all other animals really. And so that kind of gives us the ability to think in an abstract fashion, to store and process social information, um, and also to kind of think in more kind of complex and imaginative ways, right? We also said that over the last 30,000 years, we've been the only homo species around, right? Those other ones have disappeared for some reason. And we said that <clears throat> this may be um, a product of interbreeding, right? So we may have combined with other species, although that would make them not really species, but that could have happened. We also could have replaced them somehow, either through a violent kind of conflict or just by the fact that we are better suited by the environment, right? We are more competitive, we're more able to get food in any kind of conditions. And so we might have just been a better fit for the environment, right? Or it could be both of these things at the same time. And I said, we don't really, we don't really know which of these is true. It's probably a bit of both. But the point is, is that after 30,000 years, we're the only ones left, right? So we started watching this documentary um, from Niobe Thompson. Um, Oh, that's interesting. That should not be my last slide. Uh, let me just see. Sorry, I have a 
minor technical difficulty here. Um, did I delete the slides that I wanted to delete? That'd be that'd be bad. Um, are they still here? Uh, let's see. Oh, good. Okay. Whew. Thought I was in big trouble. Okay. Put here. Nope. There we go. Whew, that was a close one. Okay. So, I asked you all of these questions. I would like to discuss them with you now. Okay. So, according to Niobe Thompson, the host of that documentary, what does he say that Homo sapiens does better than any other animal? Language, for sure, but... We started walking on two feet. Right, we started walking on two feet. But, but our species in specific, what are we really good at? Cognitive thinking. We yes. Language. Yes. We can learn for long language. There it is, yeah. So, we can, yes, we can do all of those things, right? But Niobe Thompson's big revelation in this documentary is that Homo sapiens is adapted to run and not fast, right? We're, we're very slow. Even the fastest of us, like we saw in the video, is not very fast. But we can run for a very, very, very long time, right? And we saw that at the end, right? We saw those people in the death race. How far did they have to run? Do you remember? Yeah, they, they had to run over three mountains. What was the distance? It was a, well, not quite, yeah, it was 125 kilometers. So you've got to run 125 kilometers over three mountains straight, right? And that's, that's a long, long way, right? And we saw Niobe Thompson attempt it. We saw him kind of... He gave up like the two knots. Yeah, yeah, he, he still ran 100 kilometers before he was like, okay, I can't can't do it anymore, right? But that um, the woman with the short blonde hair, Diane Van Deren or whatever her name was, holy cow, right? She did it without too much trouble and... There were more, like, old people. Yeah. There were some older people in there, right? But remember, she, she tore a leg muscle partway through and she, like, duct taped her leg and kept going? Holy smokes. That woman is tougher than I am. I'll, I'll gladly say that because that is true. Um, but pretty incredible, right? That's a long, long way to run. But those people can do it, right? Now, one of the things at the beginning of that, or toward the beginning of that documentary, they talked about um, animals like Australopithecus and, and chimpanzees. And they said that they said that our anatomy, especially our kind of lower body anatomy, is different in a number of ways from those earlier bipedal hominids. And what did he, what did he point out? It was Daniel Lieberman, the sort of older guy with the glasses and the white beard. What was he talking about? What kind of adaptations do we have that other bipedal primates don't have? Because they walk awkwardly. Right. So that comes a little bit earlier, but yeah, so our, our leg bones are kind of positioned in a V, which keeps our, keeps our feet under our center of gravity. That's part of it. But he pointed out a bunch of things, a bunch of adaptations. Down. What is it? Sure. Uh, yes, he did mention that at one point, right? So Homo sapiens are bipedal primates with longer legs and shorter arms. That makes it much more, that's easier to move around on two feet. And there is one thing that you mentioned on, that do not produce much energy and have first things to Right, right. So the first thing he mentioned was, we have an arch in our foot, right? You can't see it with these kind of shoes, but it's there, right? And he said that that allows us to kind of store energy, right? And they have a flat foot. That's yeah. why they have to be awkwardly to walk. And not so much awkwardly, because the, the difference here and the difference, the, the thing he pointed out is that 
a lot of the adaptations that we have for running that we're going to go over right now kind of you don't really need them to walk right so you can kind of walk around without really activating any of those features that Daniel Lieberman mentioned the thing is that when you run that's when they start to work right and so this sort of spring that you have in your foot is kind of fun this is actually kind of fun to walk this way it's kind of fun right but you don't need it you don't need it to walk right I don't need to use that spring at all to walk and I really don't no big deal right but if I'm gonna run that becomes a very important thing right and Daniel Lieberman said to Niobe Thompson, if you jump up and down, where do you land? Right? And you land on the ball of the front part of your foot. You don't land on your heel. right? If anyone wants to try it, stand up, jump, and land on your heel, you're going to feel it. right? It's going to be like in the cartoons where those guys go you know, You're, you're going to feel it. Right? So this is a running adaptation. right? We have these arches in our feet that kind of bounce and when we run we're kind of jumping from foot to foot right and that spring kind of stores up energy sorry <laughs> and releases it back to us right so that's one of them we have an arch in our foot what's another one we have, we have big okay hang on hang on one second we have we have big butts and we cannot lie right <laughs> so what are, what are those big butts for besides being comfortable to sit on? It's for It's for what? Yeah, yeah, it's a balance thing. Right? So our 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 butt muscles, right? Our gluteus maximus muscles, they are attached to our legs and to our hips and to our lower back. Right? And so he said that this keeps our upper body from kind of flapping around while we're running, right? That would be really disorienting, right? You'd probably fall down. And so when you start running, those muscles start to clench to keep you stable and upright, right? Your upper body is in place because your butt muscles are kind of holding, holding you sturdy, right? And he said, and you can try this at home, I'm not gonna try it here because might be inappropriate. But he said if you grab your butt muscle and you walk around at home, you'll, you actually don't even have to grab it, but you can feel it's not really doing anything back there. It's just kind of sitting. But if you start running, that muscle is going to start to work, right? And it's going to stabilize your core, right? You don't need that to walk, just like the arch in your foot. You don't need it to walk, but you do need it to run, right? What was another one? What, which ones? Uh, they have to connect to my lower muscles and connect to the neck. Oh, right. Did anyone catch the name of those ligaments in your neck? He said it, I think he might have only said it once, so he would have had to be quick, but did you catch it, anyone? No. Okay. Uh, where's the pen, where's the pen, where's the pen? It is. He was talking about the, the nuchal ligament, okay? So that's attached to your arms and your shoulders. And what does it do? What's the function of that? Yes. And make the balance. Yes. Uh, more specifically. It helps to be steady. Is what? Helps to be steady. Yeah, it helps keep your head steady, right? So while you're running along like crazy, maybe chasing after your beloved on Valentine's Day, <laughs> or maybe running away from their boyfriend, or I don't know, whatever. <laughs> your, your personal life is none of my business. But while you're running, again, your head might flop all over the place, right? And of course, that would be very disorienting and you'd fall over, right? You need something to hold your head in place. You need something to hold your head in place, right? And so. The nuchal ligaments help to do that, right? And so if you're running, you'll kind of notice, or if you even watch people run in slow motion, you'll see that their head's actually, amazingly, that it's not really moving, right? Their whole body is running away, but their head is kind of almost in the same place, right? And so 
It allows you to kind of keep your balance, keep your eyes on where you're going, right? Very, very helpful. What are those ligaments connected to? Our shoulders, human shoulders, or homo sapien shoulders, we said that they were loose and they were low, right? We have loose, low shoulders, right? And so that kind of motion, right, as you're doing that, it kind of helps you to kind of keep your balance, but it's also helping to stabilize your head as well, right? So that arm movement is kind of working to stabilize your head while you run. Uh, there was another one. Might have been two more. I'm trying to remember how many. Definitely one more. Short tones? Short what? Tone? Tone? Short toes. Oh, short toes. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, we have we have really short toes, right? What was what was the problem with long toes? Yeah, right? So Think about a pencil, right? If you've got a long pencil, it's easy to snap. If you've got a short pencil, it's really, it's really tough to break, right? And so same thing with our, with our toes, right? If they were longer, we wouldn't be able to put the kind of force that we can put on our toes because they're, the bones are kind of short and wide, right? So shorter toes allows us to put more force, more torque. We can kind of run harder, right? You got long toes, you gotta be careful, right? Or you're gonna break them. Okay, so there was nuchal ligament, the shoulders, the butt. Oh, there's one more. There is one more. The butt sounds so funny. The butt sounds funny. Oh, yeah, that's a funny muscle. Um, what, one more thing. Yeah. Did anyone catch the name of that one? That one's even more difficult. Catch it? So, I apologize for my writing. It's terrible. It always has been. I don't seem to be able to fix it. Um, so, that's the Achilles tendon, okay? And you can feel it. It's kind of connected to the bottom of your heel and it goes up the back of your calf. And you can feel it if you kind of like if you stick your leg out and kind of like try to stretch your toes back toward you, you'll feel it kind of uh, stretch out uh, right in the back, right? And so you can stretch out that Achilles tendon and what does it do? What's its function? It gives us the force to move. It gives us the force to move, what did you say? Yeah, it gives us the force to move by acting as a spring, right? So. When, we, when we're running and we stretch out our leg, we're kind of stretching the spring out. And then when we hit the ground, the spring contracts and gives us a little boost forward, right? So this spring is constantly being stretched and sort of recoiling back, giving us back free energy, right? And again, Daniel Lieberman's point was that you don't really need any of those to walk. Right? My shoulders don't have to do anything. My head and the balance is okay. I don't really have to use my nuchal ligament. My butt's not doing anything. My arched feet aren't doing anything. My Achilles tendon, well, it's kind of stretching a little bit, but not much. None of these things is really happening when you're walking. It's only happening when you run. As soon as you start to run, all of these things start to operate. And like he said, they start to operate without you without you really trying, right? You don't really have to do anything or concentrate or all of these systems just start to work, right? And they make us very kind of smooth and efficient runners, right? And again, earlier hominids didn't really have any of those. Homo erectus had some of them. So Homo erectus probably would have been a runner, probably not as good as us, but they, they could have run probably, and other ones as well. But prior to Homo erectus, you wouldn't have seen Homo habilis running like us. You wouldn't have seen Australopithecus running like us either. We have much more um, 
pure running adaptations than, than those species did, right? We're, like Niobe says, we're endurance runners. Right? Oh shoot, there's one more. There's one more thing. Oh yeah, give me more there. Like this one a lot. Right. Okay. Right. We are very sweaty animals. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. We are the sweatiest animals on the face of the earth. Right? Disgusting. But um, but it's true, right? Lots of animals cool down by panting, right? So the dog on a hot day is <laughs> right? Glad my mask was on for that one. Um, that's how dogs cool off, right? But humans have the ability to soak their skin from the outside, from the inside out, right? And once it's wet, we get evaporation and it cools us off, right? It's kind of gross, makes us stink sometimes, right? But hugely useful, right? We can we can run and we can cool down while running. Right, which is something other animals can't do. Other animals have to stop and just cool their body temperature down. Right, we can just keep going. And so, how did how is that an advantage to us? How could we use our running adaptations and our ability to kind of cool down? How did we use that to our advantage in the past? Yeah, to hunt, to hunt animals. How did we do that? How, or how did that work? Yeah, yeah, so that's, that kind of advantage, we can, we used it, we used it to our advantage, right? So. Animals like a deer or an antelope or something like that, they can run, but as they run, they get hot. And the only way they can cool down is to stop and start to pant, right? But creatures like us, we don't have to stop, right? And so we can't catch them. They're too fast for us, but we just keep running, right? We keep following them. They try to hide. They try to cool down. We keep chasing them. Right? And eventually, their body temperature becomes too high, and they're basically having heat stroke. Right? So if you remember in the video, they went up and threw a couple of spears into that antelope or whatever it was. And yeah, the animal didn't know where it was. Right? It was overheated. It, was, it, was, it had heat stroke, and it was delirious. It had no idea where it was anymore. And again, that can happen to humans too, right? We can get heat stroke if we get too hot and the same thing will happen to you. You will be lightheaded and you know, you might faint and you might not know where you are. And so, yeah, we basically can run animals until they have heat stroke. And then it's a very simple job of, you don't really even need any tools, right? A few of those guys could have jumped on the antelope and hit it over the head with a rock and that's it, right? You don't, you don't need any fancy tools. You don't need bows and arrows or spears or any kind of technology at all, right? All you need is your body and maybe, um, maybe being able to cooperate with other humans. And you can run down almost any animal out there, right? And if you run them far enough, they will just die of heat, right? And so that's a big deal, right? That's a, um, that's a big deal, right? That allows us to hunt, even though we kind of don't have any other tools to hunt, right? We don't have claws, we don't have teeth, we don't have speed, right? We can't run down other animals like a lion can, but now we can hunt them kind of in a different way, but that's a big deal, right? Homo habilis found access to a new source of food with his tool or her tool, right? Being able to break open the skulls of these animals and access their brains. But Homo erectus and hominids after Homo erectus 
Well, now they can actually hunt their own animals, right? And imagine, you know, Homo erectus benefited from have, having access to this brain, right? This source of food. So think of all the calories there. But now with Homo erectus, think of all the calories in a whole animal, right? Now these hominids can hunt an entire animal, right? Thousands and thousands and thousands of calories, right? Fat and meat and organs and all of that stuff. Huge, huge advantage, right? And again, made possible by a number of different modifications to our body that allow us to, um, to run, right? Um, let me jump to question six here. Well, should I jump to it or did I just answer it? I'm going to come back to that question because I want to I want to show you a little bit, little bit more. Okay, so here, of course, are some of some of these adaptations that we've talked about. Right, an arch in the foot, the Achilles tendon here going up the back, the gluteus maximus muscles up there, our ability to sweat, um, our loose low shoulders, our nuchal ligament kind of running down the back of our skull and then attaching further down into our shoulders, our ability to sweat, all of these things kind of come together, right? And so let me try and put this together in a way that hopefully makes sense. So we saw through this sequence of evolution, we saw that brains certainly became larger, right? And more complicated from about 5 million years ago all the way to today. We also saw that the faces and the sort of teeth of hominid, bipedal hominids became smaller, right? So as time went on, we didn't need to chew such hard, heavy foods, especially after we started cooking our own food with Homo erectus. And so as our brains kind of grew, our faces kind of shrunk, right? And we have much smaller faces than um, other creatures that came before us. This is a Paranthropus skull looking at the top and you can see it's a very strange, strange thing because this creature would have had a round head, but a lot of it here wouldn't have been brain, it would have been muscle, right? Because those are, those two holes are right here and we have them, but they're just not as, they're not nearly as large. Um, yeah, so we can see brains getting uh, bigger. We can see faces getting smaller. Show that in a few graphics. Overall, we've become larger hominids as well, right? So our Australopithecus ancestors started out about three or three and a half feet tall, kind of small, small creatures, right? But Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis were both large hominids, probably the same height as we are today. Like we mentioned, legs became longer, arms became shorter, right, to sort of more efficiently walk on two feet. And we saw our, we didn't really talk about this too much, but really every bone of our vertebral column and our sacrum, all of that got redesigned, right? Because again, it was, I won't be able to draw this. Eh, maybe I will be able to draw this. If you look at, if you look at a, a vertebrae, if you look at a bone from the back, you'll see that it's kind of like this, and then it kind of looks like that. And your spinal column, the nerves in your spinal column go through this little hole, right, all the way down. And so there's this kind of, yeah, there's kind of this, Kind of this disc part and then there's these kind of fins that come off it and so this kind of this kind of bone when it's in an animal where their spine is horizontal it's actually quite strong right because basically what you have here is kind of an arch right so it's kind of the whole thing is kind of built like this and gravity is kind of pushing down and it's quite strong that way and so 
animal spines like this are very, are very well designed for kind of horizontal orientation. But when you turn it up, now you're putting all the gravity right here, right? All the weight is coming down, and it's kind of squishing those disks and squishing the stuff that's between those disks because originally they were turned sideways, right? All the weight was this way. Now we've turned it on a right angle and all of the weight is pressing down on the spinal column. So there's lots of changes that have gone into our spinal column to account for this. But as we saw in your inner fish, humans have back problems pretty frequently, right? And part of it has to do with the fact that we have a spine that was really never designed to be like this. It was always designed like this. And nearly every animal on the planet has a backbone or a vertebral column that goes horizontally. We're one of the few that has it vertically and it's a, it creates problems, right? Because it just wasn't originally designed that way. Um, we see our pelvis here has kind of restructured from what we see with an ape, which is kind of a long pelvis, to one that is kind of shorter and wider, right? It's a little more like a basket. This one is more like, well, I don't know, a flower vase. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know how to say it. But it's a very different shape, right? You can see Australopithecus much more, much more like us than this chimpanzee here, right? And you can see the feet have changed too, right? Here chimpanzees have a foot that can grab onto things, but Australopithecus didn't have it, really, right? They had toes that were more in line, just like, just like we do. And I wanted to try and put this together in some sort of a graphic that kind of summed everything up. And there's a lot of things kind of happening here, but I wanted to show you, you know, the appearance of our hands, right? Hands with five fingers, kind of longish fingers, but no claws on the end with actual nails, right? They're good for grabbing onto trees, but later on, they'll be very useful for manipulating objects, right? And making, making stone tools, right? We see bipedalism show up about five million years ago here. And eventually that's going to continue to improve so that not only are we very efficient walkers, very efficient bipeds, but we're also very efficient long distance runners, right? Particularly our species. Um, and that's going to be very useful for us as well. Homo habilis here is going to start using tools, right? And tools are going to be very useful for Homo habilis to access food, um, and all other hominids after that are going to develop their own set of tools as well. We see Homo erectus start to harness fire, right, around a million years ago or so, can scare off predators, can cook their own food. Here we see Homo habilis being, becoming a scavenger, right? So. These creatures here are kind of foragers. They just find food that's lying around and they eat it. Homo habilis is finding food as well, but it's also eating what's left over from larger animal kills. They're, they're scavenging. But here with Homo erectus, we probably see the beginning of persistence hunting, which you all told me about a minute ago, where you just run an animal until it overheats. Hunting with weapons is actually very, very recent, right? It's really only with Homo heidelbergensis about 700,000 years ago or so when people start hunting with weapons, which is kind of weird, right? Because often we think about, oh, our human ancestors were out there with spears, right? Hunting other animals. But as you can see, that comes along very, very late, right? For all this time, for this five million year period almost, nobody was hunting with a weapon. Weapons hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> and so it's very, it's very tempting to think that we've been doing this for a long time, but we really haven't. And of course, here we see the sort of slow development of 
hominid brains getting bigger, getting more complex. And then our cognitive, our cognitive revolution occurring to sort of change the wiring of our brain and give us more or less the brain we all have today, right? So I wanted to put these all into one graphic and also point out that there are, um, you know, that there are connections between all of these things, particularly the development of brains, right? Our ability to access certain types of food, right? Um, our ability to use tools, right? Those things are, those things influence the development of our brain, right? But similarly, as our brains get more complex, so do our tools, right? So do our ability to create tools to make us more successful predators and more successful organisms. So all of these things are kind of happening through hominid evolution, but they're also kind of interconnected with each other and they're influencing each other. And so, yes, that one thing is happening, but it's influenced by other things as well. Okay, so I kind of just wanted to create a graphic that sort of summed up a bunch of the things that we've talked about. I don't know if it helps or if it communicates what I want it to communicate, but that's what I have for you so far. So, by way of summary, so hominids use their brain, their running adaptations, and their tools to basically move themselves in the food in the in the food chain, in the food chain, from scavengers and from prey to basically apex predators. Right, we're now at the top of the food chain. Nothing eats us unless we wander into its territory unarmed. Right, and. The cognitive revolution just 70,000 years ago has given us the capacity to think and communicate in complex ways, to organize ourselves socially in complex ways, to cooperate in more complex ways. And ultimately what we've seen here is the transition from the kind of animal that uses biological adaptations to respond to the environment to one that uses cultural, cultural adaptations. Right? So again, if tomorrow, if tomorrow we woke up and suddenly it was an ice age and it was freezing cold outside and there was ice everywhere and it was gonna be cold for centuries now, a lot of the animals around here would die, right? And they would die very quickly because again, they can't really evolve that fast. Right? They can't evolve in the space of a day, or a week, or a month, or a year. Right? But humans, humans can respond immediately. Right? We can't evolve, but we don't really have to wait for our genes to catch up. Right? We can devise new shelters, new technologies, new types of clothing. We can reorganize ourselves right, to cooperate in a different way. We can access new food sources. Right? We can totally change the way we live, and we can do it very, very rapidly. Right? Most of the animals around here have to, require, uh, have to rely on their biology to survive. And if the climate changes too quickly or the conditions change too quickly, they can find themselves extinct very fast right? because evolution just doesn't move. Evolution doesn't move super fast, but culture can. Right? We, tomorrow we can decide to do something different. If the environment changes or the conditions change, humans can adapt. Right? Animals, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Right? So yeah, we've come on this very long journey. We've seen how we've kind of evolved from a sort of a tree-dwelling primate. It's a very simple creature, all the way to one that's very complex very adaptable um, and, and very different from where we started out right and, and and maybe we've also seen how kind of strange that we are right in terms of how we see the world how we kind of manipulate objects the way that we move around the way in which we cooperate 
the fact that we have very long childhoods, all of that stuff is kind of strange, right? And so in some ways we're an animal just like any other, but in another way we actually have a bunch of adaptations that are really just not very common, right? So there are things about us that are rare in the animal kingdom and when you kind of add them all up, you kind of wind up with a creature that is actually very strange, right? Okay, so that said, does anyone have anyone else, anything else they want to ask or say about sort of the human evolution process before we kind of put it to bed and move on to something else? Yes. Uh, question five. Okay, hang on. I'm going back. Uh, why does he want to call our species Homo cursor, running man, rather than Homo sapien, wise man? Why do you? What do you think? Okay. Right. Yeah, right? So he's, he's kind of saying that, I, I think he said in the documentary that when we say, when we say that, that we're homo sapiens, right? We're, we're the wise man. When we say that, we're, we're kind of making an argument about who we are, right? Or what the most important thing about us is. But he's almost making a different argument, right? He's saying that, yeah, we have these big brains and they're pretty important and they kind of set us apart from other animals in nature. But he's kind of saying that our ability to run long, long distances, that's really, that's the important thing. That's the thing that really sets us apart from other creatures. Right? And again, it's up to you whether you agree with him or not. He's just making a suggestion here. Um, but it's certainly something that probably gets overlooked. And I, I'm near 100% positive that the first day we were in here and I asked you, what is a human? I don't think anyone said or even probably would have thought our ability to run would have been a distinctive characteristic of who we are, right? Because we kind of take it for granted, right? Especially since we're just not very fast, right? But it actually, it is a very important part of who we are. And you might, I think you might be able to argue that, yeah, is that if we didn't start doing this, then we might not have moved past where Homo habilis is, right? Our ability to run gave us the ability to hunt on our own, right? We didn't have to scavenge from the kills of other animals. We could actually get animals for ourselves, right? And therefore access hundreds and hundreds of our own calories and nutrients, right? That without our ability to run, I don't think we would have been able to do. And again, we might, you know, there might still be something like Homo habilis running around the earth with simple little tools. And that's, that would be the most complicated life form on the planet, right? But our ability to run is a big deal, right? And it is an important part of who we are and how we've evolved. Just like all these other pieces of the puzzle too, right? Our brains, our tool use, the use of fire, um, all of those things have been important in our, in our evolution, right? And if you remove any one of them, you know, the, the story will go in a different, would have gone in a different direction, I think. Okay, anything, any other questions, concerns, comments, queries? You want to take a break? Okay, let's take a little break, and then when we come back, um, we'll switch gears and we'll do different unit, okay?
All right, so we don't need that anymore or that. So this brings us to our next topic, which is, I think in the textbook, it's called making a living. But really what it's about is subsistence, okay? So when we talk about subsistence, we're talking about how a culture or how a society gets their food, okay? And this is an important thing. Number one, because we're biological organisms, right? We need, we need to eat things. Two, we all know how people get when they don't eat, right? They get hangry, and so people need to eat. And the third part, of course, is that subsistence plays an, um, kind of a foundational role in other aspects of culture, right? People have to eat before you can think about any of your other beliefs or values or practices or religion or anything like that, right? So it's kind of at the base level of culture. People need to subsist. People need to find food, process it, eat it, right? And so we kind of start there in terms of how cultures work. We need to figure out how they go about getting the food that they eat, okay? And again, that will have an influence on other aspects of culture as well, okay? So we'll mention, we'll, we'll, we'll call it this as we move forward in this chapter, the idea of subsistence strategies, okay? So the, the ways in which people or cultures get their food, and again, as you might imagine, as you might imagine, it has a lot to do with the environment that you live in, right? So if you're living in a desert, if you're living in a jungle, if you're living in a mountainous area, if you're living in an open plain, all of those things are gonna have different food resources available. It's gonna be easy or difficult to access them. And you're gonna have to figure out how to live your life in order to access that food, right? So um, again, it's a foundational level of culture that we need to understand. And um, yeah, I think I've kind of said that. Um, but again, how people get their food, subsistence strategies are connected to the division of labor. So how different, this different sexes or different age levels what kind of jobs they have in society, um, how we socialize people, how we create a political structure, if we really have one, economic strategies, how we exchange things, how we create families and how people marry, all of those things are connected to subsistence, okay? So, for our purposes, we're gonna say that there's five ways of getting food, okay? and a culture can practice, you know, two of these things kind of at the same time, or maybe even three of these things at the same time, but we'll divide it up into five categories, okay? First will be foraging, hunting and gathering, and I'll explain that to you. The next one is horticulture, or Swidden agriculture, or simple agriculture. We'll talk about pastoralism, when people domesticate animals or have herds of animals. There's intensive agriculture, which is farming a specific field in the same the same field over and over and over again and finally what we're all probably familiar with is mechanized agriculture so where we have big big farms and we have um, kind of complicated technology to run that farm right tractors and combines and genetically modified organisms and all of that kind of stuff okay so let's start with foragers Foraging should be somewhat familiar to us because we've talked about it a little bit in human evolution. And it's kind of our default factory setting for how we gather food, okay? So our earliest ancestors, Australopithecus, um, Homo habilis, would have been out there in the environment just kind of searching for whatever food they could find, right? And they probably ate all kinds of different things. And that's probably common to all of our hominid ancestors. Human beings, homo sapiens, we have eaten just about everything on this planet that you could eat that will not kill you. <laughs> and maybe some things that did kill us. But we have eaten everything possible, right? Of course, all of our cultures have different ideas about what kinds of things are food, 
and are not food, right? And so I've mentioned in my culture, we don't eat insects, right? We don't eat bugs, that's gross, right? But lots of other cultures have and do eat insects and it's fine, right? They're readily available. They're a great sustainable source of protein. They're very plentiful sometimes, but all cultures have kind of divided up the world into things you can eat or you should eat and things that you cannot eat or you shouldn't eat. But humans as a species, we've eaten just about, just about everything. And we've done it by gathering it from the environment and a little bit more recently in our history by hunting. Okay, so maybe I'll say this at the beginning. I'll say the idea that it's, it's important, I think, to understand hunting and gathering because it kind of made us the species that we are, okay? And so since, you know, our, our species appeared on the planet, you know, we've been farmers for lots of our history. Most of us are you know, either come from farming communities or we live in a society that is fed by farming communities, and that's me included. And so we're kind of very familiar with farming and what farmers are kind of like. There's lots of children's stories about farmers and animals that are on a farm, and Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. But hunting and gathering and foraging is is our original subsistence strategy and and it's the one that we practiced for almost all of our history okay guys who's ever talking please um it's it's our original subsistence strategy and it was successful for about three hundred thousand years we only started farming around 10 to twelve thousand years ago so Farming is brand new in human history. Hunting and gathering is, was our way of getting food for most of our history, okay? Now, when we try to think about early foragers, so think about humans maybe, oh, I don't know, let's say 15,000 years ago, okay? It's very difficult to know what their lives and what their cultures were like, okay? Number one, none of these people were writing anything down. Usually what you find with hunter-gatherers is that they don't, they don't really have a need to write anything down, and so they don't. There's no written language. Writing usually comes from bigger civilizations with intensive agriculture, but we'll deal with that later. Okay? Um, they own very few artifacts. They don't have a lot of stuff. What we'll talk about in a minute is that hunter-gatherers move a lot, right? They probably walk 15 to 20 kilometers a day on average, okay? And so if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna walk 20 kilometers a day and you have to carry everything you own, you're gonna make sure that you don't own a lot of things, right? You don't wanna be, you know, <laughs> dying under the weight of all your stuff. So hunter-gatherers don't own a lot of things, therefore they don't leave behind a lot of things. And so for archaeologists who are trying to dig up their evidence thousands of years later, it's really hard to find because they just don't have a lot of stuff. And they don't leave a lot for us to uncover later on. Now, we do have some hunter-gatherers that still exist, very, very few of them. But again, we can't really look at them and say, oh, this was what humans were like thousands of years ago because they kind of live in the modern world too, right? So even the people who are full-time hunter-gatherers nowadays, living out in the bush, you know, totally subsisting on their own, away from civilization, even they know what an iPhone is, right? So they're kind of connected to the modern world. They're not the same as people 15,000 years ago, right? So it's difficult to kind of know or imagine how these cultures would have been 10 or 15,000 years ago. But what we can say about foragers is a few things, a few common things. Number one, the way they use their resources is what we would call extensive and temporary. Okay? So what this means is that a hunter-gatherer group, usually there are about 30 to 50 people, they might show up in an area 
And what they'll do is they'll kind of look around for anything that's there and anything that's kind of easy to find, okay? Maybe it's some mushrooms, maybe there's some roots, maybe they find a, a beehive and some honey, maybe they look around and they're able to grab a rabbit or a bird or something. They just kind of find whatever is there. And of course, they're very good at doing this. They know their environment intimately, they know every animal, every plant, and they know how to find food at any time of year in any context. And so when they arrive, they just kind of search out what's easiest and what's available. The temporary part comes in is that most hunter-gatherers don't stay in one place very long, okay? And so they might arrive in a place, you know, hunt and gather and see what's available there, stay for a few days, and then they'll move on, okay? And so the benefit to this kind of approach is that you're never staying in one place long enough to strip the landscape of all food, right? You're always leaving things behind so they can regenerate, right? You're going to show up, you're going to pick some of the mushrooms that are there, and then you're going to leave, and the mushrooms will regrow, right? You're going to shoot a couple of rabbits, but you're not going to kill every rabbit in the area. You're going to leave, right? And so it's kind of soft on the environment because you take a little bit and then you leave and you allow it to regenerate. Right? So it's kind of easy on the environment, but it's also easy on the foragers because they're only really looking for the stuff that's easy to find. Right? And if you keep moving, you're always moving to a fresh place. Right? And so your mobility is what allows you to kind of not work as hard looking for food. Right? So there's a bit of a trade-off. It's a lot of walking, although as we found out, humans are very good at walking long distances. It's a lot of walking, but it means that finding food is never really super challenging. Right? And really what we find is that with most hunter-gatherers, they don't, hello, with most hunter-gatherers, they don't really work that hard. They kind of work about 18 hours a week, give or take, and that's enough for that's enough for all of their needs. That's enough to, for them to get all of their food. Anyone here work 18 hours a week? Yeah, plus school, right? Yeah, so if you add school into the mix, we're all doing 40 hour weeks. And here, hunter gatherers, they were only doing like 18. Sounds like a good deal. But anyway, what do they do? Whatever they want. Yeah, they can sleep, they can play with their kids, they can sit around the fire and talk and tell stories, they can have a nap, they can fix their tools. Sounds okay to me. Sounds like a nice way to uh, live your life. Um, so, another thing we should know about hunter-gatherers is that they, most of them lived in small most of them lived in small groups, okay? So we're probably looking at about 30 to 50 people. If you wanna have a kind of a soft impact on the environment, you can't live in groups of hundreds, right? Hundreds of people show up, they strip the environment clean, and then it's not gonna regenerate. It's not gonna come back, right? So hunter-gatherers tend to live in small groups. They tend to move around, but as a result, they're a very small group, and so they know each other very, very well, right? Imagine, imagine living in a group of 50 people for your entire life, okay? So some of those people are, of course, your parents and maybe your grandparents and your siblings, maybe an aunt and uncle or a cousin, maybe a few other families who are not really related to you, but just living in that small group for really most or all of your life, right? Those would be the people that, those would be your people, right? And 15,000 years ago, what you would probably find is that there's not many other people around, right? What did we say? There's about 7.6 billion of us on the planet now? Yikes. 15,000 or 20,000 years ago, there was probably 5 to 8 million people on the entire planet. 
unbelievable, right? That's nothing. <laughs> so again, you would probably go your whole life with your group of 50 hunter-gatherers, and you probably wouldn't see that many other people ever, right? When, you're, when you get on the sky train to go home, just on that sky train, you probably see more people than hunter-gatherers would have ever seen in their entire life just because there was just not that many people around, right? Um, they probably would have bumped into other groups from time to time. They might have gotten into conflicts, but usually they, you know, they would probably be reasonably nice to each other. They might trade for fancy things, um, prestige goods, fancy stone, maybe rare pigments to make paint or dye for clothes you'd probably find that you'd be living in a world with no permanent settlements, okay? Well, you would. So no cities, no towns, no roads. Um, everything, any structures that hunter-gatherers make are usually temporary. And so this would be a world that is entirely natural with humans kind of running around in it, okay? The other thing that's important to remember is that most of the environments that humans lived in were probably quite rich, okay? There's no farms. There's no, you know, there's no people cutting down forests for logging. Um, there's no environmental damage. There's no pollution. And there's not very many other humans, right? There's only about five or eight million of us. So there was a lot of food, right? And particularly for these people who really understood their environment and knew how to find it, just wasn't that wasn't that difficult right although I will say it wasn't that difficult but it wasn't that difficult in terms of effort okay so hunting and gathering isn't very hard work but what it is is very very skill based okay so you need a lot of knowledge right and you need a lot of skill to be able to go off into the wilderness with nothing and survive Right? And, and, and live comfortably. And these people knew how to do that. Right? You and I, if we went into the North Shore Mountains, probably all be dead in a day or two. Right? We don't know what we're doing. Right? We don't know how to find food. Does anyone know how to make their own clothes here from the environment? No, I can't even sew. Even if you gave me like cloth and thread, I still couldn't do it. But these people... What's that? I don't even know how to cook food. You don't even know how to cook food, yeah. But not only do these people know how to find food, they know how to hunt it, they know how to process it, they know how to cook it, they know how to avoid the food that is poisonous, like mushrooms, right? Some mushrooms are good for you, some of them, yeah. yeah. You gotta be very careful. Yeah, you gotta be very careful when you pick mushrooms. But these people knew all of this stuff. And they had all of these skills. So again, you're not working super hard, but you really have to know what you're doing, right? You really need to be skilled and knowledgeable to survive in your environment. But these people were, right? They knew everything about the places that they lived, okay? Yeah, they understood the weather, they understood their environment, they understood all of the plants and animals, which ones you could eat, which ones you couldn't, which ones had medicinal properties, right? If you had a headache, or if your joints were sore, or if you had a cut that wasn't healing very well and maybe it was starting to get infected, people knew the appropriate plants to use to heal themselves. Right? And again, they worked far few hours than we do today. The other thing we'll mention about foragers here is that they tend to be egalitarian. And the idea here is that these are societies with no rigid power structures, okay? Nobody is kind of, has more power and prestige than anyone else, with the exception of the idea that all societies kind of treat people a little bit differently, right? So we treat men differently than we treat women, right? We make that distinction. Often we treat our elders differently, right? We give them more respect, right, because they're older and wiser than us. Sometimes we give extra prestige to people who are particularly good at something, right, if someone's a particularly good friend or good listener or 
maybe somebody's really good at a particular skill, we kind of give them a little extra status for that. But for the most part, people are equal and nobody really has control or power over you, okay? At least not in the way that you know, we see developing later on, okay? The other thing we'll point out about hunter-gatherers is that they share um, everything, okay? To the point where most hunter-gatherers don't really have a concept of private property, right? This here, this thing is mine, right? It's mine, it's not yours, don't take it. If you take it, I'll call the police. They'll take you to jail because you took my thing, right? But hunter-gatherers don't really have that idea. There's really no such thing as things that are mine and things that are yours. There's just things, right? You can't really own anything. You can't really own people. You can't own the land. None of that stuff. There's really no such thing as, as private property, right? Which is weird for us because I think we all live in a world where private property exists, right? These things are mine. Those things are yours. I have no right to touch or take your things. You have no right to touch or take my things. But hunter-gatherers don't really think that way. Everything is shared. Everything is communal. There's really no such thing as mine. Okay. Um, now, I want to make a distinction between foragers, and I want to show you something, and hopefully I won't run out of time here. I probably will, but I'll, I'll show you a little bit. Um, what I'm describing to you are what we call simple foragers. Okay. So simple foragers are exactly as I've described to you. Small groups of people moving around, hunting, gathering, whatever they can kind of find. They don't have an elaborate social structure. They don't store any food. So they find food, they eat it. Maybe there's a little leftover for tomorrow, maybe. But pretty much they're going day to day, okay? Um, and again, with their technology, most of their technology is just the things that they need to live, right? The things that they need to use every day. And it's very simple stuff for the most part. And so to give you an example of this, I'd like to sh introduce you to the Hadza people, okay? And Hadza are a group of uh, hunter-gatherers that live in Tanzania, in modern, modern Tanzania, near Lake Eyasi. That's Lake Eyasi right there. Oh, that's it. Um, they and their ancestors have lived in this area of the world for thousands and thousands of years, okay? Uh, as you can see from this graphic, um, the Hadza have kind of been pushed out of their traditional territory by people who are farming, so they're kind of living in a smaller area than they, than they used to. They're, yeah, in a matter of speaking, yes, they are. They're indigenous people in Africa living uh, a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And again, there's only about 400 Hadza who are living this full-time um, full hunting and gathering lifestyle. They're living the way that their ancestors would have lived and the way that all of our ancestors would have lived prior to about 10,000 years ago. Um, so I want to kind of introduce you to these people here. I'm just going to jump ahead. Oh. I'm going to show you a short video, and it's a video made by a guy who likes to travel, and he likes to like face his fears traveling, whatever. But in the process, he actually goes and stays with the Hadza for a couple days, okay? And he, um, he goes hunting with them, he hangs out with them, and so, you know, it's kind of a little window into a way that all of our ancestors used to be, right? And again, you know, they're not Stone Age people, they're not, you know, they're not from thousands of years ago, but their lifestyle is very similar to the way our ancestors would have lived thousands of years ago, right? And so they're one of very few groups of people who still exist this way. And so I did want to show you uh, a, a good, well, I should be able to show you most of this video in the time we have left. I want you to pay attention to what kind of foods are eaten Okay, um, I want you to pay attention to what kind of technology they're using and what kind of techniques they use to hunt. Uh, and then pay attention to the division of labor. 
What are men responsible for? What are women responsible for? Most of the time will be spent with the men, okay? Because he's a guy. The only other thing that I'm gonna warn you about is there's gonna be some animal killing in this video. So they're going to kill, I think, a bat, a mongoose, and a small antelope. It's kind of a baby antelope, so it's kind of, it's a little sad. But are you guys okay with that? Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a little sad, but you know, people, people eat, people have to eat, right? So, um, okay, so if you're online, I've uh, put the link in Microsoft, or uh, I've put the link in the live chat for you there so you can watch it. We'll show it here in class, and then um, if we have some time, we'll come back and talk about it, okay? So I'll turn you loose online people to do that, and we'll watch the same thing here, okay?